Sometimes we want horror to truly frighten us. Sometimes we want it to speak to issues in the world around us. And sometimes we just want to have fun. Lamberto Bava's Two Demons films from 1985 and 1986 are pitch-perfect examples of horror as fun escapism. The son of horror icon Mario Bava, Lamberto's two Italian splatterfest extravaganzas are the epitome of taking a simple premise and stretching it to its absolute limit. Throwing every idea against the wall in search of entertaining and scaring the audience until the full potential of your film is wrung dry. These two movies, both centered on groups of people trapped in a single location, use the idea of a demonic outbreak that essentially works like a zombie story to thrill, chill, and shock. Yet, to me, it's all done in such extremes. Extreme emotions, extreme shot composition, extreme gore, that it becomes a caricature of horror. First, it's an innocent victim being turned into a demonic monster. Next, it's a dwindling group of survivors on the run from a legion of the damned. Finally, it's a hero on a motorcycle swinging a sword. There's no limits of reality, no air of pretension, just a group of creators putting everything they can think of on screen. Whether it's a movie theater or an apartment, a legion from hell has arrived to bring us the pure horror joy of Demons 1 and 2. The 1960s and 70s saw Italy rise to horror prominence with the onset of the giallo, brutally violent mysteries inspired by the country's pulp crime novels of the 20s and 30s. With directors like Mario Bava and later Dario Argento helping to define the subgenre and rise to fame through it, the giallo would, in turn, help to inspire the slasher and then be fully replaced by it. With the cycle of influence returning to Italy for more brutal, wild, and over-the-top horror movies that capitalized on the new wave of horror around the world. Creators like Lucio Fulci and his Gates of Hell trilogy helped to define the wild extremes of Italian horror in the 80s, with many more following his example. By 1985, Lamberto Bava had transitioned to making feature films after years of assisting his father's productions. And after teaming up with screenwriter Dardano Sacchetti on what was originally supposed to be a three-story anthology film, Bava, along with producer Argento, turned one of the stories into what would become Demons. I didn't like the idea of a trilogy so much, and I didn't like the other two episodes that much. So I thought to myself, but this one episode, dialed to a full-length movie, would work perfectly, said Bava. And while Argento let Bava craft the film without interference, with Bava stating, Dario, like few people, is one of those who persuades you to give your best. And I must say that at the same time, he fully respected my role as the director. The film is clearly influenced by the producer. After several drafts, Sacchetti rewrote the second half of the film, which originally took place in the theater's basement. Instead, he followed Argento's command, revealing he wanted something more in the style of a zombie film with blood and gore, with Stivaletti's effects. I had thought of a more romantic twist, more intellectual, perhaps better, but Dario surely went for something more effective. Demons, released in Italy as Demoni in 1985, is directed by Bava and written by Argento, Bava, Sacchetti, and Franco Farini, and sees a group of people arrive at a movie theater to watch an early screening of a new horror movie, only for a demonic outbreak to wreak havoc, with our survivors trapped in the theater. Once you know that this was originally meant to be one-third of an anthology, you can really see its slim plot. Demons is almost entirely set in the theater, and it really just boils down to trying to survive and escape. Our main characters, Cheryl, played by Natasha Hovey, and George, played by Urbano Barberini, are strangers to each other, but spark a romance in the midst of the chaos, while everyone else's relationships fall apart in the struggle to survive. Is this a demonic possession movie? Is this a zombie outbreak film? An apocalyptic romance? Demons isn't really concerned about adhering to any one of these subgenres, and instead is a sort of cosmic gumbo of all of them, transitioning between each when it feels like it for maximum thrills and shocks. Having demons take place in a theater, where the movie being watched is the origin of the demonic curse that's about to be let loose, is a fantastic way to quietly get past the sense of security viewers have while watching film. I've discussed this many times before, but a massive appeal of horror is that we can indulge in our fears played out in really big ways, while being safe knowing that ultimately everything we see is fake, and nothing we're experiencing can ultimately harm us. By having the horror of the movie reach out beyond the movie screen, and at one point literally rip through it, Bava is toying with our idea of the safety of the film-going experience. 
if the demons of the movie can escape their film, then why can't demons the movie escape as well? Both aesthetically and culturally, Demons is filled with gothic and punk influences, creating a modern, splattery take on ancient curses. So much of Demons is removed from reality. This clearly takes place in Berlin, where it was shot, but nothing about the characters, their lives, or the location speak to any particular real-world place. As the film becomes more and more exaggerated, its removal from reality becomes more apparent. Nothing about Bava's movie is all that related to real-world fears. There's just enough in here that's toying with our ideas of the safety of the film. Of course, Demons isn't trying to make a larger statement on the idea of horror as either safe outlet or progenitor of violence, but I love that it's playing with how the terrors we expose ourselves to get under our skin. Now, daddy don't get scared, but there's enough shocks and spills and demons to at least make me wince. So maybe I'm just a dang ass freak, but when a legion of bile spewing demons starts tearing apart our terrified band of survivors, while all sorts of insane electronic rock plays, I'm saying, hell yeah, give me more. I think that the reason behind putting demons in a movie theater, and demons 2 in an apartment, is to give the film a really fun playground for its horrors. Both films are fantastic examples of how to use your setting to the fullest extent, completely exploring the space and establishing geography in the opening act, then having the horror play out in the many different mini locations of those areas, before finally breaking the setting in the final act, for really unexpected developments you would never see coming. It's not just the film that's haunted, but the entire theater, a modern gothic cathedral whose walls turn against its occupants. In turn, the people tear it all down. Smash everything! It's here that I have to give special mention to Bobby Rhodes as Tony the Pimp, a scenery-chewing performance that's at the exact pitch the movie is operating in. It's so big and obvious, but as the temporary leader of the survivors, he's exactly what the movie needs before George turns into an action hero. It's a bit of a cliche to say that Italian horror, especially Italian horror of the 80s, is nonsensical or poorly made. What I think often happens is that the storytelling and pacing of Italian horror is so at odds with American sensibilities that people unfamiliar with the approach are immediately thrown off by it and ascribe poor quality to it. Of course, there's plenty of bad Italian horror movies, but there's plenty of bad horror movies around the globe. Like most Italian movies of the time, Demons 1 and 2 were shot without on-set sound, and with every actor speaking their own native tongue on set, with everything dubbed in post. It's a signature movie-making trait in the country, and it always creates a sense of artificiality in what's produced, even when English words are dubbed over English speakers. In Demons, it adds to the heightened nature of everything. What about the movie? I don't know how to explain it. It's just a feeling. The movie's to blame for all this. She's right. Our screenwriters also know how simple and limited their premise is, so they wisely put in a ticking time bomb in the middle in the form of a bunch of no-good punks on the road, who you just immediately know are going to get in that theater somehow and make everything worse. Once the madness starts, cinematographer Jean Lorenzo Battaglia has the entirety of the film awash in red, a glowing theatrical hellscape. It's a feeling of real heat, like the sweaty enclosed theater is turning into hell itself. But the film doesn't underline it. It just makes us feel that increasingly oppressive atmosphere. As far as the special effects go, supervisor Sergio Stivaletti brings to life our titular monsters in both films. Given that Demons 1 and 2 are filled with legions of the damned, the demons range from your most run-of-the-mill creatures, which are mostly people with discolored skin and massive teeth made possible with makeup and toothy dentures, to the scarred, chrome mask-wearing secret villain, played by director Michel Suave. Add in a little sweaty, veiny discoloration here, here, some close-up boils popping there, and you have twisted humans whose possessions have removed them far from their normal selves. Both Demons 1 and 2 share some similarities in the execution of their demon special effects. Their similar makeup, a demon bursting from a possessed at the worst moment possible, glowing eyes on a massive group running through the halls, made possible with refractive paper taped to eyes and just the right angle on the light to make them glow, and lots of slime to make them suitably icky. I wouldn't say there's anything groundbreaking about the effects of Demons, or its approach to horror, but its commitment to thrilling the audience is at the exact pitch that I love. 
It's equal parts cruel gore explosion like Fulci's best films, and part spooka blast roller coaster like Sam Raimi's Evil Dead 2, the greatest movie of all time, ranking just above Predator, Kiki's Delivery Service, Chunking Express, Before Sunset, Shin Gojira, and my personal favorite movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. The success of Demons, both in Italy and internationally, thanks to the rise of home video, spurred on a sequel, which began shooting just seven months after the release of the first. Demons 2, also directed by Lamberto Bava and written by Argento, Bava, Ferrini, Sacchetti, and Sergio Stivaletti, is, well, pretty much the first Demons, but now in an apartment building. Demons 2 opens with an English voiceover reminding viewers of the events of the first Demons. But in this sequel, the events of the first movie are just a film. Like the original, our protagonists in the real world watch a horror movie that starts to affect reality. There are some twists, however, including television being the portal for contagion, complete with a really cool POV shot of the curse coming for its first victim. Overall, I don't think The Demons 2 is quite as good as the original, but I love that it takes a little more time to establish motivations and struggles for quite a few characters, setting them off on their own small arcs separated across the building. The greater variety of locations available in the apartments, an elevator, lots of different units, a gym, the parking garage, means that every set piece feels different from one another, and the film really feels massive. The apartment-wide rampage, from top floor to basement garage, is actually something I was hoping would happen in Evil Dead Rise. And while I think that Rise is an overall stronger film due to its sharper focus and better characters, the total usage of the building is something few films have been able to do justice to, like Demons 2. Having Sally be our central demon, not just the first infected, but the major antagonist throughout, is a positive as well. I often find that horde movies can get a little lost without a central villain to put your fears on. And here, Demon Sally is a brutal, unstoppable pursuer. But she's got the Smiths and the cult playing at her birthday party, so I guess I can forgive her. Because of Bava and Argento wanting TV sales for the film, Demons 2 is a little less violent and gory than the first, relying on more slime and ooze than blood and guts. But it's actually scarier and more tense. Having dark, quiet apartment halls and units as the location of our horror, with Bataglia this time using dark blues for a cooler, modern feel, along with having characters that include a young boy and a pregnant woman, makes it feel a little more high stakes and closer to reality. It's also harder to tell who our main characters will be at first, before paring down to David Knight as George, uh, another George, and Nancy Brealey as the pregnant Hannah. The sequel's big centerpiece, the one that takes up the most time compared to anything else in the film, is a battle between our pregnant lead character and a laughably fake little winged demon, complete with very obvious wires. It's a shame it takes up so much screen time as it's just not well done. But I think there are plenty of fantastic sequences that make up for it. In particular, the claustrophobic and doomed attempt to escape from the parking garage is a highlight. As a group of survivors led by a returning Bobby Rhodes, now playing a gym instructor, and of course you gotta have this guy back, is closed in on by a tidal wave of hell. The fate of a daughter played by a young Asia Argento, the first of many times her dad put her in one of his movies, is about as tragic as these movies get. Demons 2 was more easily distributed around the world, with the BBFC not even editing it for European release, but it didn't perform quite as well as the original. Given the simplicity of the premise, it's no surprise that Bava and Argento were planning a Demons 3. However, several drafts of the script, which would have first had a comic book cause the outbreak, which was then replaced with an airplane landing in hell and essentially ripped off Alien, and then a church be the location of our outbreak, never happened. That church script was eventually reworked by Michelle Suavi, who had just finished the awesome stage fright that I covered in my 13 Unsung Slashers video, becoming The Church in 1989. The Church is awesome, by the way, a slow burn and moody film that Suavi specifically wanted to be different than Demons, which he labeled as schlock. Which, I mean, fair. Meanwhile, Bava's 1989 film The Ogre would be released in the US as Demons 3. But neither of these movies are true Demons entries. And as we reach the end of our video, I want to talk about the endings of both Demons films, as they really speak to the different outlook of each, for better and worse. Demons 2 has a relatively happy ending, with our central couple giving birth to a healthy baby, escaping our main demon, and walking off into the sunset. A really simple, almost too easy conclusion. The first Demons, on the other hand, gives us a great, nasty little surprise, as George and Cheryl escape the theater only to find that the entire city, and possibly the world, is succumbing to the demon zombie outbreak, riding off into an unknown future. 
And the little boy from the house by the cemetery is here too. But wait, the rolling credits are brought to a screeching halt as Cheryl suddenly becomes a demon. <laughs> killed by the survivors and leaving us all in shock. It's dark, but it's also really fun because it completely upends our expectations. One last example of the film itself reaching out beyond its limits to scare us. Demons 1 and 2 aren't masterpieces of the genre. They're at times sloppy, and their humor is equal parts intentional and unintentional. But I absolutely admire their ferocity and total lack of fear. In each, Bava and company take a simple premise, use the first act to wind up the tension and location, and then let their engine loose for the rest of the movie, never really slowing down or second-guessing what they're doing. These movies have the type of simple premise that wouldn't get a major studio greenlight today, but instead would be straight to video. Yet they have the needed budget and skill that a DTV movie could never afford. As they stand, Demons 1 and 2 are an incredibly entertaining horror duology that promises the audience a blast of the movies and then delivers it as thoroughly as possible. And for that, I can never get sick of Lamberto Bava's wild, joyful explosion of horror. Thanks for watching today's video, and we're back to Italian horror. If you've been following the channel for a while, I always at least cover one Italian horror movie every year. But this year, I think there will be more than one. And Demons 1 and 2 are just such incredibly fun horror movies that I just really wanted to talk about them. As I mentioned in the video, they are wild and full of ideas and not always perfect. But they are, above all, extremely entertaining. And for a big horror guy like myself, I can't help but admire the sheer creativity and amount of ideas thrown on screen every minute. Of course, I think that Demons 1 is a better movie than Demons 2, but if you like the first one, you're gonna enjoy the second. Lamberto Bava isn't one of the titans of Italian horror, or horror in general, and has always been in the shadow of his father Mario Bava, but these two Demons movies are the highlight of his career. And I really just had a blast re-watching these movies, talking about these movies, and making this video. So I hope that you enjoyed it too. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Demons movies, and where they would rank in the pantheon of Italian horror for you, as well as what other Italian horror movies or foreign horror movies in general you'd like to see covered in the channel, because I have a lot of ideas. And if you've never seen either of these movies and you're a horror fan, I highly recommend you check them out. They are readily available on all sorts of streaming services. As always, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support. And if you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video, as well as exclusive Patreon-only reviews. So until next time, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and letting a great horror movie reach out and grab you.